And thank you for joining me on the path to liberty. It's Wednesday, October 7th, 2020. And on this episode, I've got some bad news. If you're a longtime follower of this show or of the 10th Amendment Center more generally, you know we've done a lot of work over the years on nullifying gun control. We've also learned a lot over those years, both from the founders and from our own practical experience on what doesn't work. Unfortunately, when we warn about that, we're not reaching enough people. So I'm not doing my job well enough or we've just got to find ways to reach more people with this information because today I'm going to share with you two more examples, one from the federal court system and one from a local activism where good strategies are being ignored in favor of bad strategies. And at the end of the day, liberty is under even greater threat because of it. Strategy is so incredibly important, and on today, hopefully, we'll go through a little bit of that and explain some things that are going on. First of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out. It's pretty long, but it's pretty, pretty easy to remember. And that's where you're going to find everything you need to follow this show. We've got all the platforms we're on, both video, we've got live streaming and archive video, and then audio only podcast edition where we're reaching more and more people consistently, Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn. We're now on Apple or Amazon Music, and we're going to keep adding platforms. I've got a submission in over at Pandora as well. We want to reach you on the platforms where you are, but we also want to be on it as many as possible. So if someone kicks us off one, we've got others like library.tv, lbry.tv, where we are posting more and more every single day. So that's all over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. You can also find our social media channels, all the archives. In today's episode, like every episode, I'm going to link to stuff that I'm talking about and citing and reading through so you can read it in full on your own time and learn more and do more research because I'm just scratching the surface. You can also find our membership program where you can support us for as little as two bucks a month. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Let's take a quick look over at the live chat while we're still waiting for people to get notifications on the live platforms to join us. And I want to thank you all for being here, whether it's live or in the archive. I couldn't be more grateful. When I started this show a little over two years ago, I was like hoping to reach a few people. Kind of like when I started TAC, I registered the domain name in the summer of 2006. My goal was like, I'm going to start a blog. And if I can reach one person or two people and change their mind about the nature of federal power under the Constitution, then I've done my work. But as long as I guess Truth heals. As long as you keep putting out the truth, more and more people keep rallying to that flag. Anyways, I'm rambling. Hello to Richard Banks, Lord Smith, Pro Life, Pro Liberty, Tim Martin, WC, and Clay, and Tyler B, Patricia Dance, Dan Reed, Clay Davis, uh, Ketsuni. I'm sorry uh, if I pronounce that wrong. Um, oh, that's WC in Ohio. Rob Wood, good to see you, man. Daniel Snowden. And everyone else, I apologize if I missed anybody, if I've skipped over anybody. I'm grateful. I see a lot of people who I consider friends, and there's a number of uh, Tenth Amendment Center members, people who have supported us and worked with us for a long time. Rob, for example, in Kansas, we've done a lot of things together over the years. Uh, Torgo, Daryl, and everyone else, thank you for being here. Let's get right to this. And as a quick reminder, I did a bunch of episodes last Christmas time, uh, last winter, in December and then through January, even November, even before that, on the surging so-called Second Amendment sanctuary movement. Now, we've been working to create Second Amendment sanctuaries for a long time, but we don't have the reach of the gun rights organizations. 
And so we were very making very small progress. Unfortunately, though, and fortunately, on the one hand, some of the gun rights orgs started getting on board with this message, meaning it got to more people. But on the other hand, really bad strategy went there. And I did a number of episodes last year, primarily focusing on Virginia, but it actually the same message applies to so-called Second Amendment sanctuaries in Texas, Florida, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, basically anywhere they've passed. The exception might be some of the counties in Eastern Oregon who are ahead of the game. For example, from this episode of December 18, 2019, I did like 40 some odd minutes, Virginia Second Amendment Sanctuaries, Rhetoric versus Reality. Now it's important, again, we're talking about strategy. We can talk tough all we want. We can hear politicians talking about cutting the national debt. They're gonna do it on day one or get rid of Obamacare and then they never do it. It's much more important to have real concrete action that advances liberty or cuts back on unconstitutional violations of our rights rather than good talk. And the rhetoric in the so-called Second Amendment sanctuaries, I'm not gonna get into really any detail here, is mostly rhetoric. And here's how the uh, the summary of that, uh, that episode put it. Dozens of counties in Virginia are claiming the mantle of Second Amendment sanctuaries in the face of new proposed restrictions in the state legislature. But does the rhetoric match up with the reality of what's happening on the ground? So far, it's not even close. And now we're seeing how things are playing out in practice. The short version, there are two main problems with the so-called sanctuary sanctuary resolutions that are being passed in Virginia, over 100 localities in Virginia and all over the country, mostly last year, but I'm sure it'll come up again. The two main problem is one, they are resolutions and in almost every jurisdiction in the country, almost every single one, vast majority, a resolution is a non-binding political statement. They do not have the force of law. They don't ban any enforcement of anything. They don't prevent the use of funds for the enforcement of anything. It is just a political statement of the body who passed that political statement at the moment in time that they passed that statement. And it can be disregarded by anybody in the future at any time. And I warned that that was the problem. And at first, I got a lot of pushback. Bolden, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Why are you attacking this great movement? And I'm not necessarily attacking the movement. I'm attacking the strategy. Because when thousands, if not tens of thousands of people come out to do something, and they're told that they're going, this is the second problem. They're told that they're creating a gun rights sanctuary or a second amendment sanctuary. They hear the term sanctuary, which we have been encouraging people to use to lift from immigration sanctuary cities for years. We've been encouraging this and we're pushed back on again. We've been early on this again. But we push for this, this kind of language with a real sanctuary effort because we know that it makes sense to people. You hear sanctuary, you've got some kind of safety. It's a safe place for people. And in a Second Amendment or a gun rights sanctuary, it's a safe place for people to exercise their right to keep and bear arms. But if you're selling it to the general public who isn't into the nitty gritty details of how this plays out as a sanctuary when it really isn't, then you're gonna have false expectations. And I think over-promising and under-delivering is a serious problem. I would rather, much rather tell people like, look, this is our first step. A resolution is all we can get past, for example. And I'm gonna point out a resolution here in a little bit. I did a whole episode on what makes a good resolution. We only can do a resolution and then we need to do some follow-up. So it's really like, in essence, it's like opening up a steak restaurant and you've got this, a lot of fanfare and you get a lot of people to show up. People are waiting in line to get reservations for your new, your new steak restaurant. And then you only have on the menu vegan cauliflower steak. And people are pretty pissed off because you told them they were gonna get one thing based on the common usage of the term. They expected something and then they showed up. They spent a lot of time and energy to do something. And then when you try to sell them a, you know, a ribeye six months later, they probably won't believe you. So I made a number of warnings about these sanctuary efforts. These resolutions passed primarily in Virginia, but all across the country. I said two main things, well, a bunch of things, but two main things that I wanna talk about today. One, they aren't going to stop any new gun control from being enacted, period. They just aren't gonna do that. And it was a waste of time to pass these as they were being drafted and as they were being sold to the public or even not clarified to the public. And then two, 
I warned that supporters of these efforts were going to have to go back and ask the same people who passed the first resolution to now pass a new piece of legislation, or they were going to pass another resolution again. And over time, if you keep saying, well, we're, we're creating a sanctuary, well, it wasn't really a sanctuary. Now we have to pass something else. And well, that didn't really protect your right to keep and bear arms either. Now we have to do something else. Now we used to overemphasize, I think we used to do more hype and hyperbole in our own activism efforts. And I learned from my own mistakes in our efforts against the NDAA, the 2012 indefinite detention provisions of the National Defense Authorization Act, I think we overpromised and underexplained exactly what state and local legislation against that would do, and that really came back to bite us in the butt. And uh, in our long-term strategy, it actually really, really harmed it. And it was hard to get people to come back and do follow-ups when we didn't tell them that they had to expect follow-ups based on what was being passed in the first place. So I'm basically warning people on my own failure. I'm sharing with you guys my own strategic failure. Don't do this. The right to keep and bear arms is far too important to use bad strategy. Learn from my mistakes, my idiocy, really. So over the summer, we had the first round of results. What happened? Of course, uh, and here from the Virginian pilot, let me pull up this article so you guys can see the title. The title is These New Ten Vir These Ten New Virginia Gun Laws Go Into Effect Next Week. It was July 1st of this year. And all of the thousands and thousands of people, 100 plus resolutions opposing new gun control, it didn't stop 10 new gun laws from being implemented in a matter of months. That's all it took. Months later, and you have 10 new gun control laws, like a one handgun a month law, or universal background checks, or one of the most prominent ones is the red flag law. And we just got some reporting yesterday from the Virginia Mercury uh, that gives some insight on what has been happening with the Virginia red flag law, which shouldn't exist, of course, under the state constitution, which is a very strong protection for the right to keep and bear arms. It shouldn't exist, but now we have the results. And here's what the Virginia Mercury reported yesterday. Pro-gun localities accounted for nearly half of Virginia's red flag orders in law's first months. Whoa, I thought they were Second Amendment sanctuaries. If they were a real sanctuary, and I, mind you, I think the term sanctuary is actually incorrect. It's overpromising in regards to immigration as well. It's not really creating a sanctuary, but that's another episode. I covered that previously. But if you're selling people on the idea of having a sanctuary for the right to keep and bear arms, and thousands of people go out and support this, and then it really isn't, I think in the long run, that is going to damage activism efforts on the local level. It's going to push people to the federal courts, which we'll get to in a moment. So pro-gun localities accounted for nearly half of them. Three people, for example, in Virginia Beach had substantial risk orders filed against them under the state's new red flag law, which lets local authorities temporarily ban people from possessing or buying guns if they're found to be a safety risk at some point. We're all going to be considered a safety risk. And this is really just a precedent. It's a foot in the door, and they will certainly be able to expand what's considered a safety risk over time. Mark my words on that. I mean, I'm not a time traveler, but it seems pretty obvious to me, knowing all through history that power is a corrupting influence, and once they have it, they always want to expand it. So going further, again, from the Virginia Mercury, I'm not sure who wrote this, a guy named Graham, Graham Muma. It's a good report. The orders were filed despite Virginia Beach's self-professed status as a Second Amendment constitutional city, a moniker approved by its city council via a resolution passed in January under pressure from the Virginia Citizens Defense League, a gun rights group. So they are a Second Amendment constitutional city or claiming, proclaiming that mantle when what they passed with that mantle did absolutely nothing to stop the enforcement of any gun law period. And this becomes problematic because, check this out, though local politicians, they write, Graham writes, and many conservative-leaning Virginia communities voted last year to symbolically declare their opposition. Now, that's interesting because the reporting, as we push this message, and I don't want to claim that we actually uh, caused a little truth in mainstream reporting, but when it first started, even the, the reporters who were opposed to the resolutions were pointing out like, oh my goodness, they're creating uh, Second Amendment sanctuaries. You can't do this. 
And then uh, we were tweeting at CNN reporters and other mainstream reporters at all different places and like giving them links to articles. No one actually hit me up for an interview, but I asked him about it. But we were giving them information about how like these aren't actually doing things. And I think between us and some other people who actually were pointing out, then it changed. So now we see things like, oh, they symbolically declare their opposition to Democratic supported gun control measures. That is absolutely true, unfortunately. Now, if it was sold as that, a Second Amendment supporting resolution or a gun rights supporting resolution rather than a sanctuary. We're creating now this county or Virginia Beach is now a Second Amendment constitutional city. That is just a lie to me. So court records show that law enforcement agencies in some of those localities are already using the red flag law to try to prevent people from hurting themselves or others. Well, that's, of course, they want to put it in that framing. But the truth is, is that it didn't take long. It went into effect in July and immediately law enforcement started doing stuff. Now, I don't understand, just a quick aside, why so many people who support the right to keep and bear arms are also this thin blue line thing, because when you get down to it, the people who are violating your right to keep and bear arms, the people who enforce this are cops. But I just don't get it. Anyways, of at least 21 red flag cases filed in July and August, they write, this is again from Graham's report in Virginia Mercury, the first two months of the law's existence, roughly half occurred in counties and cities that passed pro-gun resolutions after the Democratic takeover of the General Assembly and elections last November court records show. And listen to this quote. I am surprised, quite honestly, that so many have done this, said Philip Van Cleve, president of the Virginia Citizens Defense League. He's surprised. Why would you be surprised that a gun control measure is passed and then they use it? Part of the argument that a lot of the really weak gun rights supporting organizations and primarily NRA and NRA affiliates or people who take the NRA line is there has to be enforcement of laws on the books. They're selling us, they want more enforcement. And that's why the current administration has the most federal gun control enforcement in the history of the country. It is the worst, two years in a row, worst, and then defeating that record even worse than the worst. And people are okay with this and claim to be Second Amendment supporters. But we know, at least on the federal level, there is no such thing as a federal gun control measure that should exist and the ATF should just disband itself, but that's not gonna happen. So they wanted, so he was actually making the case. And here, let me just read it from here. It'll make more sense from the article than from my mouth. Van Cleve argued the state could already take guns from people suffering mental health crises through temporary detention orders. And he says, quote, it just doesn't make sense why they're using it the way they are. They already had this power. We just wanted them to focus on the laws that they already have at hand. And he's surprised that they're enforcing the new one. They already have the authority, I guess. I mean, I'm not really sure what the current law on the book is, but don't ever be surprised that when they pass a law that violates people's rights, and mind you, that's mostly redundant, when they pass a law that violates people's rights, that they're going to use it. There probably is a bigger picture. Instead of thinking short term, we always have to think, how could someone use this in the future? Or how could someone use it once a precedent is established? How could it be expanded upon? Let's think Hamilton. Hamilton told us during the New York ratifying convention, Alexander Hamilton said specifically the federal government would only be able to exercise powers expressly delegated to it, period. Anything else would be void. But what he didn't tell us but he did tell us in 1791 in his arguments in support of the National Bank, which is the precursor to the unconstitutional Federal Reserve of today, was that there was a whole slew of implied powers. So all those implied powers were expressly delegated, according to Hamilton. And we know that artful politicians, and this was a warning, I'm paraphrasing from John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution, artful rulers will always come up with creative ways to expand their power under the laws that they have. So it shouldn't be a surprise to Van Cleve or anybody else, and we shouldn't be supporting the laws on the books. We shouldn't be encouraging them to enforce gun control measures, violations of people's natural right to keep and bear arms. It's not a second amendment right, it's a natural right. Going further from the Virginia Mercury, and I'm sorry if I'm ranting on this because this issue really pisses me off. In July and August, at least five red case flag cases were filed in Virginia Beach, the state's largest independent city. That matched the number filed in Fairfax County, the state's most populous locality, where officials did not take a stance against new gun restrictions. So 
someone might be saying, well, at least it's less than other places. But no, Virginia Beach, and I don't know the exact population of two, maybe someone in Virginia, we often get a lot of people from Virginia responding on these types of episodes. But in Virginia Beach, they did just as many as they did in a place that wasn't a Second Amendment constitutional county or city. So the resolution, like I warned, would do nothing to stop them. And the Virginia Police, Virginia Beach Police Department confirmed this. They said they've confiscated a total of three firearms. And some people might poo-poo that we're talking about this so early. It's just three. Well, every single person's liberty violated is a massive wrong in my book. They confiscated a total of three firearms under the new process, which spokesman Linda Keene said, quote, was a law that we are obligated to enforce. Of course, that sanctuary resolution that was passed does nothing to tell law enforcement to change their approach. She goes on. She says the council's resolution did not give us any hesitation as the police department is guided by the statutory mandate of the General Assembly legislation. That's what Keene said. What a surprise. And in the end, now, like I warned, I said, well, now they're going to have to go back to these localities and say, well, now you have to pass something else. And I think a lot of people were thinking, well, we created a Second Amendment sanctuary in our county. We heard this from a lot of people. Bolden, you don't know what you're talking about. Why are you, why are you supporting the gun grabbers? I don't know how they make that case or why are you attacking friends of the Constitution when I'm just trying to point out where I've screwed up, learn from it. I said they were going to have to go back and get something else passed because these aren't going to do anything. And now we see that playing out with the laws in, in effect as of July 1st. And what is Virginia Citizens Defense League doing? On the homepage of their website, as of this morning when I loaded it, they've got an action item telling that uh, now they have to have a new resolution passed that was similar, quote, to what we saw last year with the Second Amendment sanctuary movement. They're still saying they're sanctuaries. They're not sanctuaries. They never were sanctuaries. And they could be sanctuaries, but it has to have a totally different approach than what they've been pushing. So now they have, they're calling on everybody in Virginia to send emails and call local government, quote, to pass a model resolution that Virginia Citizens Defense League has tailored for each locality. The resolution creates a commitment by the local government to refuse to pass any gun control, even though a new law gives them the power to do so. No. This is also a lie. It is 100% false. If they pass a resolution saying that they're not going to pass any new gun control measures in the locality, then it is a political statement of the person who voted to pass it for that moment. They could literally take up a resolution one second later that says, we will pass it, and you know what? We sh if there's anything that we've learned in the last 10 to 20 years is that politicians have no problem saying one thing to one group of people and the total opposite to another group of people because all they care about is popularity, power, money, and all that stuff that comes with it. So now the CDL is going back and saying, well, okay, well, we did all this work. Now we got to redo the work. They're not admitting that the work that was done didn't do anything, but they have to take another step. That's, I think people are going to be smart enough to learn this. And honestly, I think a lot of time, money, manpower, resources, they were all spent on this. We thought, saw thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming out. Uh, you'd see in these small town city council or county commission hearings, whatever they're called there in Virginia, you'd see packed like nothing before people going out there and taking action. You have all this energy to protect the right to keep and bear arms. And rather than using it as something as a building block or actually going for something that actually has real effect, they go with this. And then now they have to try to do it again. And I don't know about you, but I know if someone tells me that what I should be expecting is A, and then I get B, and then now I have to do C, and then I'm going to get D, at some point, I'm not going to buy it. So I'd rather see, honestly, as far as good strategy, I'd rather see one locality. I would rather see just Virginia Beach or some small town in Virginia or any other place in the country, Herndon, Kansas from Ordinance 510 a number of years ago, banned the use of any city agency, city uh, money, resources, manpower, facilities, or anything to help enforce federal gun control. And that's on the books today. That's a very small locality with a few hundred people, but doing it right. I would rather see one do it right 
and then people can learn from their example, follow them, copy them, learn from them, see what maybe wasn't right, what didn't work in practice, learn, than a bunch of people doing it wrong. Or I would encourage them to pass a resolution that actually is a foundational first step that doesn't confuse people into thinking things. Make it very clear that they don't have any legal effect, but that they're there to rally people to the cause, to build awareness to the issue, and that we will absolutely need to see what happens in the state legislative session and then come back and do follow-up to build on this. But it wasn't sold like that. So if you want a resolution, I actually did an entire episode on this uh, in late January. There was a, a resolution that was drafted by a longtime friend of the TAC, Publius Hulda, and she put together, and I went through it line by line, I don't have to think every piece of it is amazing. I think it is the best resolution that I've seen by far, and there are many reasons to support using it. I will link to this episode in the show notes so you can listen to or watch and understand what that resolution is and maybe come up with one for your own place where you can take a step towards liberty. Or I did another episode. I did a ton of episodes on this particular issue four essential steps to protect the right to keep and bear arms. So I did four steps, foundational principles and some activism that people should do. This is a pretty short episode, around 12 or 13 minutes, some ideas and links to a bunch of stuff that you can do as well. I encourage you to check that out instead of the process that's been happening in Virginia. Anyways, the other thing that's a problem is the federal courts. And here from an article that we published a few days ago by Mike Meharry, he says, conservatives and libertarians often turn to the federal courts to protect their rights through an application of the Bill of Rights to the states, the incorporation doctrine. He says this is a bad strategy, and I 100% agree. He says most of the time it fails, and we end up with bad precedents that apply to the entire United States. So he's talking about a case in point where a federal judge recently upheld very strict gun control measures in Washington state, Initiative 1639. It raised the legal age, he writes, to purchase a semi-automatic rifle to 21, and it instituted enhanced background checks. Both bad, both unconstitutional, under the Washington state constitution. It also prohibited the state sale of these rifles to non-residents. The ballot initiative passed by nearly 60%. And I'm glad he put that because really the big problem is that 60% of people who voted on that ballot were okay with this. And I think our bigger problem is not getting the right, it's not about getting the right judges to force this on people. But the fact of the matter is if that many people are opposed to the natural right to keep and bear arms, we have to show them that the right to keep and bear arms is a positive that it is better for liberty, it is better for safety. I mean, for people who want to defund the police, for example, or uh, close down military bases around the world, like I do, for example, one of the reasons that you can pull that off is when you have a highly armed populace with military-style weapons. But going on, uh, Mike says, U.S. District Court of Western Washington Judge Ronald Layton upheld the Washington law. He cited current federal law. So federal law bans the sale of handguns to people under the age of 21. And so somehow that applies to Washington state. And somehow, even though there's a second amendment, the federal government is authorized to have, according to this, the, to the federal courts, to have such a law on the books. It is not. And he also cited state laws imposing age restrictions on gun sales dating back to the 19th century. Just hammering this out, Mike says, this should never have been a federal case to begin with. It should have been decided in state court under the Washington State Constitution. Section 24 says this, the right of the individual citizen to bear arms in defense of himself or the state shall not be impaired. But nothing in this section shall be construed as authorizing individuals or corporations to organize, maintain, or employ an armed body of men. So, I mean, this is pretty straightforward stuff here. This should have been a state level case and the problem is, is once it becomes a, a, a federal case, then it sets a precedent for everybody. And Mike covers this pretty well. He says a lot of civil libertarians like the incorporation doctrine because they believe the federal courts will protect our livery, to liberty from overreaching onerous state and local governments. I mean, it's like going to Al Capone in hopes of protecting yourself from Al Capone's henchmen in your neighborhood. Most of what the federal government does is a partnership with the states, and the states are not really states anymore. 
Mike goes on, he says, in theory, the incorporation doctrine empowers federal courts to police the states in order to stop state governments from violating individual rights. That sounds like a really good idea. Well, I mean, it doesn't sound like a good idea to me because I know in practice it doesn't play out like that. He says, in practice, it centralizes power at the federal level and allows the Supreme Court to apply liberty-destroying decisions to the United States. And he says, this case is a perfect example. Not only does the federal judge's opinion uphold the Washington state law, but it also sets a precedent that other judges will follow in other states. It is a bad precedent that will be implemented all over. And he says, and if the Supreme Court eventually affirms the opinion, it will be cemented as the supreme law of the land. The centralizing nature of the incorporation doctrine ensures that bad precedent will be applied across the entire United States. And that's just a quick summary. I encourage you to actually read that article in full. Mike, Mike does a really good overview of what was going on. But to close out, at the end of the day, when you have precedent upon precedent upon precedent upon precedent, all which are bad to the Constitution, bad to the Second Amendment, bad to the entire document, the Bill of Rights, and then you have federal courts treating precedent through stare decisis as more important than the original legal meaning of the Constitution itself, going to the federal courts of the largest government in the history of the world to protect you from states that act more like federal counties than states isn't just bad strategy, it's really dangerous to liberty. And we can't say we weren't warned that this would happen. Jefferson, for example, and many others warned us over and over and over and over. For example, I've got three quotes. In 1820, in a letter to Thomas Ritchie, Jefferson said this, the judiciary of the United States is the subtle core of sappers and miners constantly working underground to undermine the foundations of our confederated fabric. Three years later to William Johnson, 1823, he says, there is no danger I apprehend so much as the consolidation of our government by the noiseless and therefore unalarming instrumentality of the Supreme Court. And what's the actual end response? What needs to be done? We just go back to 1774, uh, Jefferson's summary view of the rights of British America. And I'm paraphrasing here. He says, a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as the gift of their chief magistrate. In the end, the only way liberty is going to grow is when we, the people, learn how to exercise our rights, whether the government wants us to or not. And that includes the government courts giving us permission to exercise those rights. Well, it's not really good news today, but I think at some point we got to hammer on this strategy thing. We work very hard for at least, I would say, half the year. Half of our work is about strategy and activism. It's essential to not only just talk about the right foundation, but how to get from point A to point Z, from where we are today, the largest government in the history of the world, to advancing liberty. And it's going to take really, really good strategy. And I hope this was... It's not good news, It's not, and, and none of it's awesome, but I hope it was at least interesting, I hope it was educational, and I, hopefully if you support the Constitution and Liberty, maybe you're as pissed off about it as I am. I don't have time, I've gotta actually get out of here today. Unfortunately, I do have to, uh, I do have to run, so I won't look at the live chat right now, but I promise to actually read through the comments a little bit later today. Please continue leaving comments, whether live or in the archive. I appreciate you spending some time with me today. If you want us help, help if you want to help us spread the word, smash the like button, uh, subscribe, get notifications, reviews on iTunes or other podcast platforms. All that really helps out a lot that the algorithms love it when you take action and it shows the program to more people. And of course, if you want to kick in and support us financially and put your financial faith behind our work for annual memberships, we get have these awesome membership cards. And we also have online memberships that start out as little as two bucks a month. And there's a lot of people out here as I'm scrolling through the chat, I see a bunch of people uh, in the chat who have been supporting us financially, putting their financial faith behind our work and helping us get the job done every single day. Two bucks a month is how low it starts. It's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Thank you so much for being here. I hope to have a great day and I'll see you next time here on the path to liberty.